So this is the typical format. It can change. Um, there are actually 29 test methods within MIL Standard 810. As of this version, that takes <coughs> up 683 pages, which is 85% of the document. So most of it is about testing. The um, methods range from six pages, which is freeze-thaw. There are five methods with seven pages. It can go to 93 pages per method. Vibration has 83 pages. Gunfire shock has 93 pages. The climatics team makes fun of the dynamics team because they're so wordy in comparison. But the truth is, a lot of like temperature tests are a whole lot easier to conduct than vibration tests. You don't need as much guidance. G compared to F uh, contains revisions and updates to old methods as well as several new ones. I broke this up by color to make it a little easier to understand. Some of the students here at one point when I taught this complained that I spent more time talking about climatic than dynamic. The green is climatic. <laughs> Look at that. There's more green than anything else. This is why I spend more time on it, because there's more climatic methods. The number in back is the number of methods that it has. So low pressure, for instance, has four different methods. High temperature has three, with one of those being brand new that was not in F, and so on. The highest is shock with eight. Vibration only has four. And one of those is general. So it's basically if, if your item doesn't fall into the last of the three categories, just do general. Um, ballistic shock has six, and most of us would never even have to worry about that. So the two in blue are one that, that combine climatic and dynamic testing. So here's the pie chart to go along with it. A total of 29 methods. 76 procedures, allowable variations, and room for tailoring. When I talked to the head of the, the 810 committee, he said this basically means millions of tests with all the combinations that you could do. These include the five new methods which were added to the G version. So um, we have 16 climatic tests compared to 11 dynamic and then two with combined environments. Each method holds a purpose, an application, limitations, which are what the method is not supposed to be used for, tailoring guidance, which includes the effects of the environment and information on the sequence of the test, the procedures, most often more than one, guidance on choosing proper test levels and conditions, what information will be required of you, the test process, including what happens if there's a test interruption, and then analysis of results and a list of reference and related documents. In the H version, that's going to be updated because some of the documents are so old that it doesn't seem possible to get a hold of them anymore. So we'll do a cleanup for version H. So here is the typical format. It's basically standardized to a certain point and then because of the differences in methods, it, it may change. The section numbers and headings are merely to show the basic configuration of each method. Now one of the things that's changing in the change notice is that every method will have its own table of contents. Right now vibration does, I think shock does, because they were written by the dynamic people who wanted those. But what's happening now is because it's so long, people may, they may download the entire file to begin with but then they're taking out only what they need. When I did my vibration test, I put that on my iPad, only the vibration test portion. And in that way, it's very helpful to have a table of contents for each one of the methods. What we had to keep in mind as we were doing the update is what is the media people are going to use to read this? And most people will not be flipping back and forth in a notebook. So it starts with the purpose, application, and any limitations. Then there's the tailoring guidance. So how do you select a method? It's based on the effects of the environment and the sequence. 
selecting the procedure, and there may be times when there's guidance on if you choose to do one procedure after another, this is the order you should do it in. Determine the test levels and conditions, and then after that, the numbering varies by the method. There may be environmental specific information, there will be information on the test duration and the test item configuration. And keep in mind, that includes whether it needs to be in a box or out of a box. If it can be shipped both in cardboard and a transit case, you test it in both cardboard and a transit case. The typical format of environmental test methods includes uh, information for pre-test, during test, and post-test. All of that's going into your test report. The test process itself what your test facility is, like I said before, it could be a chamber, it could be a shaker, whatever it takes to get the test done properly. The controls, so what type of controller, what type of software. Any test interruption, whether it's due to test equipment malfunction or test item operation. Then the test process. That includes any instrumentation used, that includes extra instrumentation such as uh, data acquisition units, anything else that you use to keep track of what's going on. For the test execution, they are assuming you will prepare for the test. Actually, I've seen a lot of testers that don't do any preparation. And if a specification isn't written very well, and if you get to the last step and it says turn power off, then all of a sudden you're going, oops, I never turned power on. So I always tell people, read the whole thing. <laughs> You've got your preliminary steps, and there should be some type of pre-test checkout. Now, if I've got something like this, and I probably wouldn't test this, there's really nothing I can do to check this out. I can open up the cover, I can flip through the pages, but that's about it for the checkout. But I will want to do a complete visual examination. On this one, I can say, okay, there's scratches on the cover. I may want to photograph that so that I compare it to what's happening after test. So it's, it can be easier to do it with electronics, but because it's so easy, there can be a habit developed of not doing a good visual checkout. So make sure that you don't forget to actually pick it up and turn it over and look at it if it's small enough to do that. And then the actual procedures come up. Okay, I'm seeing lots of yawning, so we're going to take a break, come back at 10 to 11. <laughs> All right, we'll go ahead and start. So for the procedures, you are supposed to select the procedures, um, maybe plural, that represent the most severe exposure anticipated, as opposed to DO-160 where it wants minimal. Okay. It's important to know this before you go into test or before the test writer or, or the test program that you have gets set up. Make sure that you understand that for defense, you are looking for the most severe exposure. You're not looking for the one in a million in most cases, but you want to go to the 99th percentile. When selecting the procedure, consider the material configuration. We talked some about that. The logistical and operational requirements, so how is it going to be transported and then how does it need to be operated. The operational purpose of the material. The test data required to determine if the operational purpose has been met. That means you actually have to operate it, okay? That's a really big clue there. <laughs> um, because I've actually seen people that run an operational test, which is easier than the storage test, and say, yeah, it passed, and they never turned it on. I so, said, yeah, <laughs> what did we just learn from this? <laughs> and the procedure sequence, as well as looking at the procedure specific advice. Now, Pierre brought up a, a very good point when we were on break, which is there can be times that we are so focused on what we think the weak part is, or what we know that we need to check, that we tend to ignore anything else that may have gone wrong. So. Be careful that you try to look at everything, not just, for instance, using this as an example again, I can't just look to see whether the button's broke. 
I have to turn the unit around and see what else could have gone wrong. So a lot of times we tend to focus on just one portion. Don't forget the rest of it. Uh, section five is analysis of results, which is a little bit different for each method, and then the reference and related documents. These, a lot of people just don't like to read part one, okay? It's a lot of pages. I don't blame people for not wanting to do it, but that's still not a good excuse not to. That's where we get the tailoring advice. That's where we get our tolerances. So when the methods refer back to part one, it's good to actually go back and read those paragraphs. Most people aren't going to, so I'm going to highlight the ones that are referred to most often. The opening note on almost every one of the methods now says tailoring is essential. Okay, the 810 team wants to make sure that people understand. Don't pretend this is a cookbook. Don't just be lazy and follow the numbers. Make sure you have measured data. Select the methods, procedures, and parameter levels based on the tailoring process described in Part 1, Annex C, which we looked at with the tailoring advice, and then apply the general guidelines for laboratory test methods in Paragraph 5. We looked at some of the Paragraph 5 information in Annex B of the first book. So the environmental engineering tasks include general, looking at the tasks that, that uh, we described earlier today, test 401 for, uh, through 406. Now, the general laboratory test method guidelines start out with test conditions, you have tolerances, what type of test instrumentation you should be using, which the method will tell you, stabilizing test temperature, which includes the operating and non-operating, the test sequence, test level derivation, your pretest information, your test setup, pretest baseline data, information during test, what to do with interrupted tests, combined tests, post test data, environmental effects and failure criteria, the environmental test reports, what your water purity needs to be a general information on the analysis of results instead of the specific information in the methods, monitoring and total high temperature exposure duration. Your test sequence directs the readers back to part one 5.5 where it tells us that we really need to base that sequence on the item, the intended situation dependent use, program assets and so on. We talked some about that. Now, things, it, he's using some type of, of small computer, okay, a, a touch screen with, with a stylus. What happens if he loses his stylus? Okay, you, you need to think about things like that. In my case, I have long fingernails, or longer than most men. And so a lot of times you can get away with using a fingernail as a stylus, but not always. If that's an integral part, you may have problems. I would never buy something like that for a soldier because people will lose a stylus. And where do you get the next one? Okay, look at the bullet holes behind him. You know, do you, do you think he can run to the closest depot and say, hey guys, I need a new stylus. So this would be part of a, a, an intended situation dependent use. Could the person actually be under fire when they're using that? Could they be out in the sun and is it going to come up and say, please put me in the, in the shade? <laughs> the test sequence, there are times it is extremely important that you do things in a certain order. There are other times when it is as, and not as important and that's going to depend upon your specific item. So if there has been historic evidence that has shown that one test is better done before or after another, then you will be given that guidance. Still gives a lot of leeway. What's funny is, ask the climatics team what an aircraft out in the desert on the runway sees first, temperature or vibration. The climatics team will say temperature. The dynamics team will see by, say vibration, okay? 
it's because they don't consider the aircraft to be operational until it's turned on and in their mind vibration is the first thing it sees. In the minds of climatic people, because it's already sitting at a temperature, that's the first thing it sees. Which group is right? There is, in a lot of cases, there is no right or wrong answer. It's just a different point of view. You want to relate the cumulative effects on performance and durability. And to be very, very honest, a lot of this is going to be guesswork. You don't know exactly how much life your test is taking out of something. You don't know if the test you've been asked to run is so strong that the item should never be sent out. Even if you make measurements, you don't know how harmful that's been. But you don't always get to put something on a shelf. So you need to have at least a fair degree of confidence. And you, you hear this more in dynamics than in climatics. A degree of confidence in what the testing was able to find and in the durability of the product that has just been tested. So no magic number for that. No, it's amazing. <laughs> People would like magic numbers. Yeah. Hmm. You can see all the, the sand this tank is kicking up. This is actually done in Arizona, but they're trying to, to look for the same types of effects that would be seen around the world. What they found in Afghanistan is that the shards of sand are actually sharper than anywhere else in the world. And even though it says that you should consider using the actual soil from other countries where, where, whenever possible, or other areas it says, it is illegal to carry sand back to the United States. Have any of you flown internationally? One of the questions on the form is, do you have any soil with you? It will be confiscated because there may be organisms in it that could be damaging when they get back to the United States. So to do a good sand and dust test, they had to build a sand chamber in Afghanistan, which surprised me. I would have thought that being at war, this was a few years ago, that being at war, that the United States government would make allowances and, and at least let the army bring in the same type of sand. What was happening was it was bad enough that it was actually jamming triggers on guns. The dust was so fine, and, it, and this never occurred to me that this could happen. You have air pressure in your tires to keep them inflated. The dust was so fine it could actually get through the seal. And they would find that they could not drive the vehicle because the bottom third of it was full of dust. Right? So, so they, they couldn't get it to move forward. And I would not have thought that the dust could have gotten through against the air pressure. They found out many things that they never knew during the wars there. When you develop a test sequence, it's best not to do it all on your own, especially if you believe that someone may come back and ask you why, because it, it may be hard to explain to somebody. So it's good if you have the test sponsor, which a lot of times is the customer or else the government, the tester, the evaluator, and the end user early and often to ensure trackable, reliable, and realistic test effort. Now the end user may be a soldier, so you may not be able to get them involved. What's funny, when I was started working on Apaches, they said, well, we can get you any pilot you want to talk to. And I said, well, thank you, I appreciate that. I don't want the pilot, I want the maintenance man because I wanted to know what was going wrong. Pilots get out. They tell the maintenance man something's wrong. They don't understand all of what's going on. If you get a chance to talk to somebody that's actually had to work on something out in, out in the field, and it can be hard to do that, but that's where you're going to get some of your best information. When I went to the ground vehicle show in Detroit, it comes to Cobo Hall every year. Yeah, I love it. Um, and the last time I went, I, I, I shouldn't have done this. I wore a dress. I should have just worn something much more casual. Uh, and there was a soldier next to one of the ground vehicles. And they had um, special chains of some type all around the tires. These tires were big. I mean, they came up to here on me. And so I was, was taking a look around. 
but they had, you know, on, on your regular vehicle, you have about five lug nuts. Well, they had about 50. <laughs> so, so you know, he kind of looked at me, he called me ma'am, and, and it was clear he didn't think I knew what I was talking about. But a lot of women don't know automotives. So I was asking him, I said, okay, regular car, you have five lug nuts. What are all of these? And so he started to explain it to me. And one of the things that they had done, and the reason that there were so many, there were bolts sticking out with nothing on them. That's what I was really interested in. You know, why don't these have something on them? And he said that at one point, they were afraid that that center section of the wheel was heat radiating. So they put a cover over them, and after a few months realized they really weren't heat radiating. Now, wouldn't it have been nice if somebody did a thermal survey in the lab <laughs> before they figured out that, that they thought they had to put these on and then figured out they really didn't? And then I talked to him about the remaining ones. And I said, you know, a lot of people seem to be under the impression that if something goes wrong with a ground vehicle, you take it back to the garage. Or if something goes wrong with an aircraft, you take it back to the hangar. And I said, but I don't believe that's the case. And he said, no ma'am, when it breaks down, you fix it right where it is. And because they go in shifts, the average ground vehicle for defense gets driven 20 hours a day. So if you have a problem with that, that tire, <laughs> you take care of it right then. You don't go back with a flat tire. So I said, so how do you guys make sure that you can fix this quickly? I'm sure you don't have a pneumatic gun out in the, in the the field, and he says, ma'am, even if we did, we wouldn't give it to the soldiers because not a single one knows how to use a tool. Okay, what happens when somebody tries to do maintenance and they don't know what they're doing? Exactly, they can break something else. But I wouldn't have had that information if I didn't talk to somebody that was out in the field. You don't always get that chance, but if you can, talk to somebody who's actually been there and you'll find out real conditions, not what the people behind the desk would like to think the conditions are. More pretest information. Now, um, we talked about this before, about the test facilities and instrumentation required test procedures and so on. Now, this is actually a field test because not, not all of your tests will happen in the lab. This test was on the high power water jets. For this particular case, that was what was most critical. When this same a vehicle is on land, do you think that the water jets are still the most critical? No, so it may be very situational uh, um, dependent. So I, again, you want to know the test duration level and so on. Cooling provisions. This is the Eurocopter cockpit, and they are going to have cooling conditions. Some type of a, a ramjet cooling where they actually have outdoor air coming in to be able to cool the electronics. Because up in atmosphere, the air is cooler than it is on the ground. If for some reason that vent got blocked, what's going to happen to those electronics? You should be testing for that, just in case, because it may happen, and it happens on, on some aircraft. This is actually an example, and this is why it's so important. Okay, these chips look pretty much the same, right? But do you notice that on the right-hand one, it's all one color, and on the left-hand one, you can actually see differences in shading across the chip. <laughs> it's very subtle, but it's there. One of them says Intel R, Pentium R. The other says Intel R for registered, and Pentium TM for trademark. Very subtle difference. Looking carefully for anomalies can aid in detecting your counterfeit parts. Now, not everybody is going to be familiar enough with the first one that they're going to notice a second one. So it's good if you can also have photographic evidence on hand. 
but because defense is such a huge target for this, keep in mind during your testing, the reason for a failure may actually be the counterfeit part. So then you want to have a chance to, to re at least replace that, possibly go back to the supplier. really liked this. This is a Hellfire missile, a model of one, but you get to see the inside. Sometimes, even as testers, we're not allowed to do that. Somebody just hands something off to us and says, make a fixture, test it. <laughs> and you have no clue. Now, again, with center of gravity, a lot of people tend to think of the center of the item as being the center of gravity. Not in something like this. It depends on how the weight is distributed throughout. And so you need to make sure that you find the center of gravity of whatever you're going to test. So that should be done clearly pre-test, not during test. So you need to, to find out the data that, to make the test work the best as possible, functional parameters and so on. Clearly we're not going to operate this missile completely during test. Okay. When you are testing your missiles, does, is there anything that you turn on? No. Usually it's just the component level missile. And if we, uh, the, the final test is we'll condition it to its operating temperature and go out there and shoot it. Okay. So the test is over with, so you don't really collect any, you know, other than penetration data. It penetrates so much armor that you pass and also jet tip velocity and stuff like that. Okay, now with the Hellfires, when they're testing those, they actually have a motor in them. And so for operating, it's not that they're going to fire it off during the, the operational test, for instance, they're vibrating, but they will make sure that that motor turns on. So it's going to depend on what you have. But it's nice if you actually know what you have, instead of just being able to look at the outside case. For during test, Taking data during tests, I have had tests where this has happened. And the reason why is my accelerometer was coming loose. This is a great alarm. If I come back, you know, uh, I allowed my people, if, if normally we never had anybody in the test lab alone unless we were doing overnight testing. And I would tell whoever was there because we would allow them to watch a video. But I would tell them the longest they were allowed to leave the chamber was to go to the bathroom and back. That was my rule because I promised the customers constant surveillance. If you came back from the bathroom and saw a chart like that, you would know that you had to do something about it. So it's great if you have a good data acquisition. You're, you are going to want to make sure that you do your performance checks and that you plan in advance where you want them. For instance, if you're adding the two together, like I mentioned yesterday, where do I do my vibration on my temperature? Am I going to do it on the ramp? Am I going to do it on the dwell? Am I going to choose different times to do it? Do I do it every third cycle? Do I do it every cycle? All of that needs to be planned in advance as part of the monitoring. This last point is important, where cost concerns preclude monitoring, because some things are very difficult to monitor. Consideration should be given to the consequences of undetected intermittent failures. Now, again, you're, you're being asked to imagine something that there's never anything you can do about, but it would be good to at least think about the consequences and, and be able to tell your boss, this may be going wrong and there's no way I can get to it to find out if it is. Information during test, you want to describe the test facility that you're using, including the, the, any software, the test item response, and any test interruptions. Post data, now, here, um, it's, this was from Aerospace Testing International and, and so they're actually testing up at the front of the plane. Uh, after completing each environmental test, you want to examine the test item in accordance with the material specifications. There is nothing wrong with doing further examination, especially if it's visual. 
Okay, if they're asking you in this case, only look at the nose cone, but yet you notice that somehow there was an issue with the windows that you weren't expecting. Okay, there is nothing wrong with noticing that and noting it. The, the only time I would say that you need to be especially careful is if you decide you want to look inside of something. Typically, you will not open anything that has a hermetic seal. And you want to make sure that you're not breaking anything when you open it. That's a good question to ask whoever is ordering the test. May I open it to check for any additional damage after the test if they don't actually specify that up front? Operate, it, operate the test item when appropriate for obtaining post-test data. In most of these tests, they expect operation afterwards and they are very specific when they don't. And then you want to compare those results with your pretest. Now, why do you think that post-test, do you think this was a mistake or do you think this was on purpose? To again ask for a test item description, test equipment identification, and so on. Why would they ask for this both pre-test and post-test? Make sure nothing changed. Mm -hmm. There have been cases where somebody noticed that something failed and they took another unit and put it in its place and the original tester came back and never knew. If you actually have to go through and check the serial number again, that's a good thing. In the vibration section, if your shaker breaks, you are actually allowed to go to another shaker to continue the test. This is why you have to give the test um, equipment identification again, in case it got changed during test. See, that amazes me. Chamber people would never say, if your chamber breaks down, it's okay to just gather everything up and go over to another chamber. But vibration people say, if the shaker breaks, go find another one. That there are differences between the climatic people and the dynamic people. It is very important to write down any deviation from the plan test program. And sometimes we take care of position of the specimen inside the, uh, where it's put in the box or uh, a rack of things like that because mm -hmm. you don't have the same effect. Yes, and, and that's important. Maybe you decide partway through the test to take something out of a box because it could either be an open storage or it could be enclosed in a box. So you change that part way through. That would have to go into the test report. And that may be a, de a deviation from the plan test program if the customer walks in and says, by the way, this is what I want you to do. At that point, you need to take their verbal word over the written word. And so you deviate from the original plan. But anything that changes, um, in including any uh, unexpected test interruptions. And we have them, you know, uh, in, especially the issue came up when I was down in Orlando area, was well, all of a sudden we didn't have enough power. There would be brownouts and the system couldn't pull enough power to keep going. So you wrote it down as a test interruption. Make sure that you collect a performance data on the same parameters at the same operational levels as you did during pretest, so that you can compare apples to apples. Comparison tests may need to be run at times. Um, this, these tests were run to, to find out how much corrosion could be done because they were looking at the possibility of using different metals. And there may be times, this is why we're asked to do a test. Now, you, if you don't actually hold them up next to each other, you won't really know. Because with two of these, it's kind of moderate rust. With two, there's just a little rust. Okay, and, and how do you explain that well? It's the, this is why photographs are, are so good in test reports. So. If you need to do comparison tests between products to show which one is doing better, do an actual comparison. And, and don't just look at, at each item as totally standalone when it comes to a comparison test. You could do a comparison test, like I mentioned before, where when it, it failed on test number six, you use an item just for test six, and then you use another item from one through six 
then you can do a comparison between those two. Comparison tests are good because you don't know if you just had one unit that had weaknesses in it by, by mistake and it's a one in a million chance. You do the initial failure analysis. You don't have to do in-depth unless you are ordered to somehow. But according to 810, just the initial, which a lot of times is visual or from your electronic readback. Make sure you have a signature and a date block for the test engineer or technician to certify the test data. Whenever I can, I get a second signature. If the customer isn't there, I have someone else in the test lab who actually watched me do the testing give a secondary signature. I did that about a year ago. I was doing testing for a company in Singapore, but doing it in New York. And so they could not fly because they had to have special visas. They could not fly in to see it. And so what I, I did instead for the second signature was I had the man who was in the test lab with me at the same time sign off. And I involved him in every change I needed to make during the test. So it, he knew that I was actually there running it. That can, can save your testing life. It is to make sure that, that you've got that and don't forget the date because otherwise somebody can think that you've made it up. For the monitoring, you need to monitor the chamber parameters. Um, you want to ensure that the chamber settings are correct and the desired environmental conditions are being maintained. And an environmental engineering specialist should work with the customer, and that may be the tester, to tailor the monitoring requirements to the customer's need. I have never had to do that unless the customer directly came to me and said, I need these particular things monitored. I, I have had customers that wanted extra thermal couples within the chamber air, okay, because they wanted to have me ensure temperature uniformity throughout the chamber. So, but I, I don't offer that. You know, if somebody comes to me, I don't say, so do you need any extra monitoring? Because it's too easy for them to say yes. Um, and, and in most well, cases, you yeah. <laughs> in most cases, you don't need it. But if you're asked to do it, then you should try to have in mind how you can go about that. So monitoring the item during test, if you have the data, you can make decisions. Okay? It is so important to have data. If you are not measuring something often enough, you're going to miss it. This is one of the problems in PyroShock because it takes 0 .01 seconds. What happens if you didn't catch that 0 .01? That's a very small amount of time. How often do you take readings if it's the longest of the humidity tests, which is 270 days? Once an hour, once a day. You need to figure that out in front, up front, so that the monitoring data makes sense. You, all of this is done so that you can have a meaningful test item failure analysis. Have you ever tried to do a failure analysis when you haven't been given enough information? Okay, if it's your job to do the failure analysis, you are going to be more sure than anyone else what you need to monitor to make sure that you can do that easily. This is another test that I ran. Um, it's a, a, it was a console for a new car design that was coming out. And there were three different plastics used within this. Now, I always asked my customers that wanted a heat test. This was a, a step stress. And, and so I will ask them, do you want me to take it past the melting point of the plastic? And about 50% say no until we get close to it. And then about 75% of the people that said no change their mind and they say go for it. Let's see what happens. In this case, the needles were set to automatically go between 20% and 80%. So it wasn't actually as if you were revving the engine and you could read the RPMs and the speed, but it was just preset to go back and forth. I always ask my customers, just to, to, so I know whether they have a good feel for their item, what do you expect to be the first failure? 
and he said that it was the motors that drove the needles that they already knew that they wanted to go out and buy new ones that were better but the ford was pushing them into doing the testing i told him i expected the clear plastic to melt first and my reason behind that was because it was heat formed anything that is heat formed is more likely to be susceptible to heat again and it was hanging on by just a sliver on the side by this point. You can see the white behind. Because the three plastics had different melting points, the white had a lower melting point than the black, which finally, as it bulged, pushed against the black, it stopped the needle from moving simply because of the force against it, but the motors were still working. By allowing this test to go beyond the first failure, they were able to find out that the motors they had chosen were perfectly fine and they didn't have to buy new ones. So there are times when it is good to take your test beyond, to have a certain critical component that you're looking for and when it's acceptable to have other components fail. So your test that setup, it will tell you how to install the test item in the test facility. Install it in a manner that will simulate service use to the maximum extent practical with test connections made and instrumentation attached as necessary. That's what's expected unless you are told otherwise. So don't put something upside down because you think it's going to be safer during test. Put it the way it will actually be. For the test item operation, operate the test item in the most representative operating modes from performance and thermal standpoints using duty cycles and durations that represent service use. So if it's turned on eight hours a day, then you know that it should be turned on eight hours during the chamber. Okay, uh, this is, is another example of the test setup I did. Um, in this case, it, these clocks had two solid feet and the other feet actually would depress. And the reason why is when the clock was face up, that's how you hit the snooze button. You just reach over and hit the top of the clock, those two feet would depress it automatically start the snooze cycle. Because of that, I had to test it upside down for vibration because those feet that could depress were becoming vibration isolators. So there are times when you may have to change the, the way that something is mounted to, to get rid of something like an isolator during vibration. Now, if I was running a temperature test, I wouldn't have done that. But during vibration, I did. Well, but make a hole there to get your feet out of that uh, vibration. I could have removed the feet, but um, but the decision that we made was simply to turn it upside down because that way we altered the product as little as possible. Because removing one part could actually put more or less stress on another during the test. For the environmental effects and failure criteria, now most people follow their own programs. If you don't have a program set up for this, you can certainly use this guidance. You want to make sure that the interruption, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the interpretation of the effects of an environmental test, they depend on the purpose of the text in the context of a specific acquisition program. In some cases, what might be a pass might be a fail somewhere else. When we have the acceleration crash test, it doesn't matter if the item works afterwards. It matters if it could fly off what it's bracketed to and harm someone. So in another case, I might be doing some type of shock to make sure that it's still operational so that it can be the same exact part, it can be getting a very similar environment, but there might be very different pass-fail criteria. 
You want to take a look at structural degradation, but that won't necessarily be your pass-fail criteria. Again, it's dependent on the test. Performance anom anomalies. Now, several of these will actually say that there may be allowable degradation. So if something gets too cold, maybe it's okay if it only works at 90%, or if something gets too hot. You need to know that before test. You can't run a test and then go back to a customer and say, oh, by the way, we didn't tell you this before, but there is allowable degradation, so this curve is perfectly fine. Some customers might fall for it. The thing is, is if you did a few more cycles, is that degradation going to grow or not? So you should know it in advance. Here are some of the most common conditions that could constitute material failure. Things such as a multi-use helicopter may be redesigned or have different options depending upon the program. Now this is the inside of a, a Chinook. Okay? Most helicopters are never going to have to have water coming in. Anything that is now, I should use the mouse, within here, I need to be very careful of my electronics, especially if this is seawater, because I'm going to get all types of corrosion. Even when the helicopter lifts off, if it drains most of this water because of the angle, chances are it won't drain quite all of it. You close up the tail, and you've got very high humidity conditions, condensation conditions, so you should know in advance. Now, things get retrofitted in the field all the time. I went to the, they, they have in Kalamazoo what they call the Air Zoo. I was born in Kalamazoo and lived there for quite a while. So I went to the Air Zoo to see some of the military aircraft. One was a Huey from Vietnam. And there was a bracket that, that was attached to the side. Basically, it came out straight. It was only about this big and there was an angle underneath. Not the entire thing, but only at the end to help give it stability. And underneath, there was equipment to create smoke, try to, to try to hide yourself as you're going. There were wires coming up that only had a regular ring terminal at the end that you screwed in. Vietnam had some of the heaviest humidity that the United States ever saw, so I knew that went on in the field, because otherwise somebody would have protected that. It didn't matter if it had the covering overhead. Yes, that would protect it from some rain. How many rainstorms have you seen with absolutely no wind? Okay, the wind could have blown up under there um, as, as they were near water and, and hovering and with the, the rotors going around, wind could, or, or the water could have splashed up. So I asked in a base, could anything actually be added in the field and done incorrectly? Oh, no, no, no. And I'm saying, okay, here's the example. And then it was, all right, yes, it could. It, it's amazing how people want to deny the fact that they're doing something that could end up causing failures. So you may be thinking about that in advance. If I add this in the field, what are the chances that I'm going to have issues with it because I can't do it as well as when it was originally built? For the environmental effects and failure criteria, a deviation of monitored functional parameter limits beyond acceptable limits established in the pretest performance record and specified in the requirements documents now, you need to be careful with this because maybe you gave yourself way too much latitude in pretest. So make sure that your numbers in pretest are realistic so that you know if your item goes out of tolerance. Now, in a case like this, they couldn't so much use the center of gravity, but they put it on the way it fit the best. Do you think that then this will be representative vibration throughout this? Now, you really need to get the bulk of the vibration through the center of gravity, which is more likely to be here because of the weight distribution. So someone could say, yeah, I passed this test, but was it necessarily a valid test? Sometimes you have to do the best you can knowing that it is not absolutely correct. 
but don't make excuses for yourself. Certain types of material, such as propellants and electrically driven devices, are often expected to demonstrate decreased performance at an environmental extreme, particularly low temperature. Now, do you do that with your munitions? Do you say it's okay if they don't work as well when it's cold? Okay, so we make a x-ray uh, to look if we have some cracks there inside. And uh, <coughs> when they fire, they, they make some study there. And I didn't see the result myself because I'm too far from them. But uh, they make a, a measurement after uh, to check the performance. Okay, and, and what about you? Do, you? do you know if your group allows any degradation? They, yeah, they do. They, on your specification, it usually has a percentage of uh, penetration fall off due to cold. And like when you're using propellants and stuff like that, they burn slower. Yeah. So. But for a laptop, for instance, I don't get allowable degradation. Okay, so it's really item dependent. Um, you, you need to be very careful that you're watching out for anything that does not fulfill safety requirements or could develop safety hazards. Now, we are not specifically doing safety testing. That doesn't mean that we can ignore safety issues. There were two men down in the Redstone area that had, one of them, I believe, had 20 years of experience, the other 22 that blew themselves up doing a missile test. It can happen to anybody, no matter how much experience you have. It was very sad. They had a, a nice memorial service, but you can't bring those people back and they should have known safe practices. And after it blew, there's no way of telling if they did something wrong or if there was something inherently wrong with those missiles. You want to watch to see if something is not fulfilling specific material requirements. You want to test item changes that could prevent the material from meeting its intended service life or maintenance requirements such as a corroded oil drain plug that cannot be removed with the specified tools. I've seen this in cars, because <laughs> a lot of shop again, where the bolt um, it ended up becoming stripped and you couldn't get it out. Okay, at some point that filthy oil that's getting filthier is going to damage the car, the car can't run, and it's all because of a stupid bolt. Okay, you need to remember that things like that can happen with very simple components. You want to, to watch for any deviation from established environmental impact requirements. I was surprised the Army has this in here. The UK also does this. This is like exhaust emission levels beyond established limits, seal failures that allow oil spills. They are still worried about pollution, even though they are at war. I guess in my mind, because I tend to think along pretty simple lines, <laughs> I tell people I am simple, um, that during war, all the, the other rules fall away, but it's not true. Okay? And, and there are a lot of civilian um, types of missions that are run by the armed forces. So they have to make sure that they're fulfilling emissions laws and so on. Additional failure criteria as specified in the material specification. I told you about the circuit board that changed color. That was not specified. I wrote it down in the test report, but someone could specify something like that. I went to Cisco Systems in California, San Jose, and they had this rolling cart. And I said, what is this? Is this failures? Because some of them were pretty obviously broken things. And, and they said yes, and there was one particular box about this big, it was for a network server, and I couldn't say anything wrong with it. And so I said, what's wrong with this unit? And they said, do you see that little arrow? Now, there was a little white sticker smaller than the end of my pinky with a little red arrow in it, pointing to a missing piece of paint, no bigger than a pinhead. And he said, that's the problem. We, we can't ship it. And I said, is it functional? <laughs> and he said, oh, yes, yeah, completely functional. And I said, then why don't you use some touch-up paint and ship it? And he said, our customers expect the best. They will get only the best. 
in their mind that was a failure. And I have no right to criticize them for feeling that's a failure. A failure. They are looking out for their customers and they feel in the long run, they make more money. They can replace that cover. They can have the entire thing repainted instead of looking like it had touch up paint. It is up to the person who orders the test to help to give you the failure information. And they don't always know. This was actually a photo of a corroded oil plug. Online, they actually have something like, this is fiatforum.com, but there are a lot of auto specialties online that will tell you how to get that bolt out. Because apparently this is a pretty common problem that people have issues with their oil plug. Mm -hmm. You drill and tap with an exercise breaker and keep going. Yeah. <laughs> As you're laying on your back if you don't have a lift. <laughs> yep.